uh, who has his PhD in ecology and zoology from the University of Tennessee. He was actually a postdoctoral fellow here. He had a Miller Fellowship in Integrative Biology um, a few years ago. He then moved on to a tenure stream job at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and he was there for about four or five years. Yeah. He abandoned that to come back to the Bay Area, um, and he is now uh, heading up the EDU Research Initiative at 3DR, which is what he's actually here to talk to us about today. So some applications of drone technology in uh, archaeological research and research in general. So I think it's on the minds of many of us today, so we're very, very excited to, to hear and talk about it. Excited to be here, yeah, thanks for having me. not all off, we'll have to fall asleep. Um, it, it's nice to be up on campus. Anytime I can come up to campus is fun, and then I can go out to lunch somewhere nice afterwards. Um, I'm kind of sick of Fourth Avenue. So we're down on top of the Cal building, actually Cal Services down on Fourth, so that's where if you go down there to pay something, usually you'll see drones. You'll see drones flying ahead. Yeah. Um, so I am a recovering academic. Um, <laughs> And we can, I can talk, I can give a whole talk on like entering the for-profit world. I'm just having, so I'm actually trying to publish a paper right now and editors are really skeptical of like what I'm trying to talk about. Now that I'm in the for-profit world, they don't like trust my academic credentials. Um, and so I'm learning a lot, like transitioning out of academia on like what's cool and what's not and kind of the, I, I service academia. Um, so like I, I can recommend what you should buy and what you shouldn't buy, et cetera. But, um, you know, being in kind of a sales marketing role, like where my heart's still in like research is kind of, it's really interesting. Um, so I, I always show this picture. So I'm the academic program director. I am an ecologist. I'm trained as a community ecologist. Um, I still have a graduate student who's trying to finish this spring and we're still writing papers and things. But now I work for a Silicon Valley uh, drone startup called 3D Robotics. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. This is me in Africa. I was working in Kenya for a while. Um, it's just to prove that like, I'm a biologist. It's this picture. <laughs> and I can drive Land Rovers. Um, and now I do this. I stand at booths, and I come and give talks. And, and I deal um, with hundreds of different universities and schools across uh, the country, if not the world. So I deal with everything from K through 12, kind of STEM education using drones, all the way up to kind of high-end drone research, so like controls theory and, and navigation um, and swarming capabilities, kind of more on the mechanical engineering side. But I talk a lot about drone applications and mapping in particular. Um, so I'm excited to be here talking to you. I'll be at the big archaeological com conference in Orlando. Is that where it's at? Yeah, I'm trying to get the booth. We'll be the first drone company um, to to exhibit there, I believe. Um, and that's all me. So like, I feel like archaeology is, is kind of one of the big use cases for drones, particularly high resolution repeated measures and mapping. Um, that's something we can do now seamlessly. So I'm going to throw a lot at you. I'm going to end on time. I'll skip over a bunch of stuff. I kind of threw in a lot of different videos and things in here to kind of show the capabilities. Um, but let me run through 3DR. So 3DR was founded in 2009 by Chris Anderson, former head of Wired magazine. Uh, we started in a garage over by the other Berkeley Bowl, not the original Berkeley Bowl, but um, we're the largest in North America. Um, we're second raising within the FAA of certification for drones in terms of use for commercial purposes, which I'll talk a little bit about, but not too much. Um, we are an open source drone platform, so our autopilot is an open source project uh, that is now part of what's called the Drone Code Foundation. So we're building that sim similarly to a Linux based um, kind of coding um, so that the, the code itself is now bigger than 3DR. It's kind of an open source platform that lots of companies and universities are taking part of. Um, and so the timeline for drones in general, we're not talking about military grade drones, which is a whole other topic that I know nothing about. Um, we're talking about kind of the consumer level drones. So let me just run through the history. So 2009 was not that long ago. I was finishing my PhD, going on um, for a postdoc. Drones were really about kits and parts. So they were, came in like a pizza box and you would solder them together in your garage and come up with this flying contraption that you can either fly manually with a little remote control or you can set on missions. Mostly this was middle-aged men who probably still lived at home with their mothers in their garages, tinkering, like it's very geeky kind of society. That's kind of where it's at. 
In 2012, we came out with the Pixhawk Autopilot. So the Autopilot is just a brain. It's what makes a drone go in X, Y, and Z, or yaw, which is the turning. It's, so you can think about the Autopilot um, is really the controls of the drone itself. And Autopilots, there's lots of different Autopilots. Military has their own Autopilots. This is an open source Autopilot that's developed on by developers all over the world. Um, you can then put this on any kind of autonomous vehicle that you want. So you can plug it into a car, you can put it on a plane, you can put it on a quadcopter with four rotors, an octocopter with eight rotors, you can put it on a, people put it on a tractor, you can put it on a boat. You could probably put it on a lawnmower. You, so it's really just about autonomous missions in space, right? So that's kind of the brain. But then people started putting them on kind of off the shelf, consumer grade remote control vehicles, things that were really well built. Um, but now you can do autonomous missions with a, a plane instead of manually flying the whole time. You can just set a mission and let it go. From there, people actually started not wanting to build drones. Um, they wanted something off the shelf ready to fly. You don't want to spend six weeks or six months building a vehicle. You just want to go to the store and you want to buy something that does what it does. And you can put a camera on it and you can take pictures, et cetera. This is 2013, 2014 into 2015, kind of off the shelf vehicles, whether it's a plane or whether it's a copter, it's going to fly. It's going to do so mostly reliably. Um, and you know, it's kind of an advanced remote control vehicle, something that will fly in X, Y, and Z, but you can pre-program it. Ready to go, put in a battery, you don't have to build it yourself, right? So we went from kind of you know, 1960s computers to like 2010 MacBooks in about three or four years. Uh, from there, there was a diversification. Um, so we were the first drone company to go into a big box retailer you can buy in Best Buy now. Um, but there was a diversification, particularly out of China. Uh, the largest drone manufacturer in the world, in fact, is, is a Chinese company called DJI. Um, but a lot of copycats um, kind of emerging, and a lot of companies that are putting our autopilot on off-the-shelf platforms that aren't 3DR itself. Um, then a lot of services. So Drone Deploy is in instantaneous mapping. They used our autopilot for originally for their mapping platform. A lot of ag uh, companies coming out that are doing the data services side. So they're overlaying on top of the drones the data services, which is really the future of drones. And we can talk about that at the end. A lot of educational use. So every day, if you flag drones in education, which I do in Google Alerts, you'll see another school that's at the forefront of drone education out there and going to be the leader, the first ever in the country to have a drone education program, yet another one. Um, and then in 2015, we released Solo. So this is our Solo platform. Solo is a whole nother beast in and of itself. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is, but Solo is really a smart drone. So a smart drone is not just a remote control object. A smart drone it, is based on a tablet or a phone-based app that controls the drone via controller. So this is a Wi-Fi hotspot, which means you can log into the Wi-Fi with your phone and you can open an app and the app can go from the phone to your controller to the drone. So what does that do? It essentially turns drones into flying smartphones, which makes drones all about the data and the apps and the sensors and less about the drone. Forget the drone. Forget this black thing that flies in X, Y, and Z. It could be black, it could be blue, it could be white. It's all about the link from the drone to the phone to the cloud. And that's the way you should really think about drones is as smartphones with propellers duct taped to them. So the drone part is just the phone part, right? If you're like, wow, this iPhone is really great for calling my relatives on their birthday, you, and it can store all their numbers in it, you'd be like, oh, that's great. That's a great use of an iPhone. <laughs> but it's really all the other smartphone applications on top of it. This is why Google and Facebook and Qualcomm and all the telecommunications companies are interested in drones. It's not about the flying thing. It's about the data. So what are some of those data? Um, this is just about Solo. Solo completely integrates with GoPro at the moment. A lot of that's because the hobbyist rules are, and the hobbyist market is all about a flying video camera and selfies and kind of cool cinematography. You can stream the GoPro down to your phone in a live view. You can HDMI out the back so you can go to a bigger screen or a jumbotron, et cetera. You can get that live streaming video. Um, and so it charges the GoPro and then you get the live stream back to your phone via that Wi-Fi signal that's there. Uh, batteries are it's the same LiPo batteries, but now we've made them smart. So before, when you would plug them in, they would probably blow up if you didn't, if you uh, let them overcharge, which is like those, the, um, uh, the things that everyone are riding around on right now that are like banned everywhere. The hoverboards, right. They have LiPo batteries that like don't shut off. Ours shut off when they're like 
fully charged um, and tell you how many times they're charged, et cetera. So the battery technology has gotten better. Um, you can just kind of pop them out. They last about 18 to 20 minutes. That's kind of industry standard right now for LiPo technology. Batteries are getting better um, too. And then we have this kind of simple interface in it. So before, if you look at like the old school remote controls of like a year ago, they're like all these switches and a big radio, et cetera, super complicated. We've pared that down so that there's like really simplified controls. So there's a fly button that you push for the drone to fly. There's a power button for power. There's a pause button for pausing the drone and when it's on a mission. And there's a come home button, which calls the drone home. And there's an A and B button. So you can fly manually. Um, but a lot of what drones are about is about being a flying robot, which is essentially what they are. And then we have the gimbal. So the gimbal stabilizes um, the camera. So if you really want good pictures and you want good cinema, you need a stable camera, something that's not going to wiggle around with the vibrations of propell propellers. But the gimbal also is kind of a robot in and of itself. So as a drone moves, if you want to follow um, an individual frame or a particular shot, the gimbal can stay in place until as needed. Even if the drone's pivoting, the, dr the gimbal will stay put. So there's a lot of controls that go into the gimbal itself to get that shot, to get the framing right, as well as for mapping. Um, and so our motto is we help people see their world from above, and that's what drones have done. They've added a whole new perspective to people's lives, and it's kind of why there's a big fad right now in cinematography and videography to get that aerial perspective, because your house and your property looks a lot different from the air, and now we've kind of democratized that for better or for worse. We can totally argue about that, preferably over a beer at Bobby G's and some pizza uh, later on. Um, but in general, like, We've allowed people that before you had to have really expensive aerial flights if you wanted an aerial perspective or you needed a helicopter. Now you can do it for the price of a laptop and you can do that every single day as often as you want. And we leverage our open source platform to create great user experiences. So it's also really about simplifying the user experience. We don't want a really complicated platform for mapping. We want it to be kind of one touch. So what does that look like? So we've automated these smart shots. Let's see, maybe I'll switch to this one because it's more archaeological. No, nope, that's less archaeological. That's more sci-fi. Let's see here. So we have a couple of different smart shots. These are professional level shots that you can just pull up and you can tap on the app and you can get the shot. This is a cable cam. We have an A and a B button. You can pair the drone and just have it run on the cable just like a Super Bowl, only this is a uh, virtual cable. For so this is an archaeology, an archaeological site in Italy. We shot with the Italian tourist board. This is an orbit. Pull up the app, hit orbit. You can get a perfect circle of your site. As you raise that circle, the gimbal will pivot down. Beautiful shot. This, nobody's flying this. They're just marking where they want the circle to go and pressing play. This is a selfie. A selfie is just a pull away cable, basically. So as the drone pulls away, the gimbal is also tilting. So you're getting this four axis shot. Um, and so it's really beautiful. The cable cam is super useful for linear transects. So you're, the drone is stuck on there. And it looks really cool. So to get some of these shots, it would take you years as a professional pilot to get the skills. Now you can just upload your solo app. You can go in and frame up your shot, and you can hit play. So super powerful for storytelling and cinema, which is kind of where that market was at from 2015 to 2016 to the next two months or so until the commercial rules come out. These are our pilots. We pay them like nothing, and they're like 22, and they fly all over the world. Uh, but they have the coolest jobs, so they get to kind of fly everywhere. Uh, and they're great, like, but we don't pay them very much because their job's so cool. In fact, um, our team, so to illustrate the storytelling, um, our team, and they're based out of Austin, our marketing team, has taken Solo. And what Solo really does is it gives a professional level pilot even better skills. It kind of, it's kind of a complementarity effect or an amplifying effect of storytelling so that we can tell stories and sh get shots that have never before on Earth been done. You can't do it with a helicopter, but you can do it with a professional pilot with a good eye and a flying robot that can get the same shot every single time. So what we've come up with is a sci-fi series. It's called Life After Gravity. You can see it on YouTube. And what it's done is strung together all these smart shots, these automated shots, into a story 
Um, that's told from the view of like there's this space agency and like this whole storytelling aspect of it. Um, and it's shot all over the world. And now we're crowdsourcing the shots to tell this science fiction story using all these pilots across the world, all strung together using GoPro and 4K video. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but there's like this crystal and then there's this agency and it's this whole thing. The useful aspect of that is that we've done a director's field notes. Um, and it's really about how they framed all the shots. So you can go through, you can watch the sci-fi series Life After Gravity, but then Adam and some of the other um, photographers can tell you how to frame those shots and how to use smart shots. And the, the benefit of this is you can become up to speed in about a half an hour um, on just basically how to use the tools and how to frame the shots for all of your talks or your lectures or your teaching, et cetera, just by watching kind of what they did in the field for these different episodes. And so I just push that as kind of, I know it's kind of consumery, but the aerial perspective and using these shots and setting them up correctly um, is actually incredibly powerful. A pivot, an orbit of your study site or this cable where it starts on top of your study site and then pans out and gives you a reveal um, of the entire landscape. That, is, that message can tell more you know, in a fraction of an instant than you can in, in half a lecture. So you can go through and kind of look at how they did all these different shots. Um, let's see here. So the next aspect, um, I won't go too much into this, um, but we launched some new shots. This is all kind of consumery, but I'm rethinking of them in, in a kind of a tool sort of way. We launched two new shots. One is a multi-point cable cam. So instead of going from A to B to, or A to B in two different frames, now we can go from A to B to C to D to E to F. So you can go from one site to the next site, up to a reveal, back to your field truck, et cetera. So you can, and then you can save that and you can fly that site over and over and over again. So as you're doing a dig, you can go from one dig site to the next you know, site and frame that and do it through time. So as you you can get that time series storytelling um, in 4K video, it's pretty phenomenal. The other aspect that I won't go into is our drones will follow you as you're doing you know, a particular transect or at your study site if you want to have them follow your track or follow you for a particular storytelling. Um, now we've made it so it's free look. So you don't have to look at, at you or the object that is following your phone. It follows the GPS in your phone. You can now turn the drone so it can follow. You know, it can look behind you as you're walking, if your students are walking, or something else is behind you, or in front of you. So you can set the leash at wherever you want for the drone, but you can also have it look freely as needed. Pretty useful storytelling. Um, we have lots of stuff on the website. I want to skip some of this consumery stuff um, and get to really the future. And the future of drones is really commercial enterprise. So right now, our lawyer Nancy is in Washington, DC, spearheading the FAA Committee for Commercial Rules, um, which are coming out shortly. So you will see an explosion of commercial use of drones starting this summer as it becomes much simpler to get permission to use drones. And that's both for the academic space as well as the commercial space. EDU is kind of lumped within commercial at the moment. And so really all of this is about the, the geospatial information that we're already collecting, right? We're already using, in this case, Autodesk but, or ArcGIS or if you're in the insurance industry, Exactware, right? We're already using these products that are like these huge, there's some open source ones out there if you really want to try and go free, but for the most part, ArcGIS, probably the standard, right, that most folks are using. So it's really taking the drones and getting those data and pushing them to the resources that we're already using. That's the future of drones. That's where the commercial industry is, is headed. Um, so it's really about time, measuring things in 4D. So we've been doing X, Y, and Z, and the fourth dimension is time, right? Robots are really good at repeated measures in a fairly accurate way, much better than graduate students, right? Graduate students, they get tired, they get hungry, they have like partners they want to go home to. You can only keep them around for four to five years unless they get in a fellowship. Drones, you send them out every single time, save the mission, fly, transect to site one, again and again and again. You can do it hourly if you want, right? A high resolution, one to five centimeter resolution or lower depending on what camera you're looking at. How do we do that? This is just time series data, thinking like an ecologist. If we think about climate change, invasive species, habitat destruction, you know, poaching, all that's time series data, thinking like an environmental scientist, but you can imagine the time series data um, that you want to tell in either shallow time or deep time, whatever you're trying to do. Um, 
And so we can monitor the planet in ways like we've never been able to do at really smaller spatial scales, probably the spatial scale that you're working at in the field, um, but over and over and over and over again for almost free, right? The, the charge of a battery. Um, so we have lots of different payloads for different accessories, and the main accessories that most of the commercial industry is interested in are probably the same accessories that you're interested in. So high-resolution mapping cameras you know, that can get down to the sub-centimeter level for mapping in 2 or 3D, which I'll talk a little bit about. Multispectral, so there's this new multispectral camera that just came out. It's the size of a GoPro. It's four bands. Uh, it's $3,500, but it's half the price of previous multispectral cameras. Um, and so for vegetation mapping and monitoring, this is mind-blowing, and it weighs almost nothing. This is by a company called Parrot. It comes with a light sensor, so you can photocorrect, you can fly in cloudy days, sunny days, et cetera. Thermal cameras, LiDAR, our platform can't really handle LiDAR yet, it's still too heavy, but the LiDARs are now down to about two pounds and $8,000, whereas they were fifty dollars to $100,000 before. With a lot of the autonomous vehicles, LiDAR is becoming a lot um, used, you know, fully integrated in cars, et cetera, for real-time mapping in 3D. And, um, and I think we'll see LiDAR uh, get smaller, cheaper LiDAR um, over the next one to two years. Yeah, it's a laser for laser mapping. So that's sub-centimeter, millimeter, you know, couple millimeter level um, mapping. We have an open app development platform for a lot of the drone apps. So you're going to start seeing a lot of app companies, just like with your phone. Um, and so the way that you want to think about the, the future is really forget about the drone. Like the drone is stupid and boring. It's really cool and novel right now, but it's loud and annoying here in the next couple of months. It's really about what sensor do you put it on, what's the application that you're using, and how do you send it to the cloud and manage the data and push it into the products you want or manage the terabytes of information within your lab, across labs, across universities, within government agencies, across government agencies, and then crowdsourcing, which I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So this is like high resolution geospatial data. It was already a metadata problem from satellite data. It was already a metadata problem on less frequent intervals for um, aerial data, you know, manned aircraft data. Now it's an amazingly mind-blowing data problem for, you know, the everyday user, um, particularly researchers that, that can afford a little bit more than, say, a farmer. Uh, we just launched on Monday uh, a new app called SightScan. I'll run through a little bit of this app, but it's to push right now to our first, uh, our first partner is Autodesk for all the Autodesk products. Um, our next partner is uh, ArcGIS or the Esri product drone to map. It's in beta right now, but it's basically pushing it into the drone and app stitching platform, and then you can push those geotiffs or whatever file type you want into your, your different la data layers. Um, so this is aimed at kind of the Autodesk crowd, which is like heavy commercial kind of construction. There's three different aspects of it. There's survey, scan, and inspect. Um, these might be useful to you. These are the Autodesk tools. Um, and this is kind of the Esri. But it looks like this. You pull up your tablet and your phone. We, this works on Android only. We don't have an iOS version at the moment. There's three different buttons. You can scan, survey, and inspect. Inspect. Um, the drone takes off, you can slide it, you can tell it what altitude to go to. This is all on the tablet, you're not using the controls. And you can just press on the map where you want the drone to go, and it'll go over to that area, it'll fly over, it can inspect in the ways that you want, um, and then you can change you know, the way that you're inspecting it. This is mostly for like cell phone towers and windmills and solar arrays and things like that. It might not be quite as useful to you. You can take a picture. Um, you can use the little toggles to get really fine scale movements of the drone. So you're not flying yourself. You just tap it a little bit and it goes up just a little bit if you want to fine tune. And then you just take a picture of the area that you're inspecting. Um, you can use your finger to point on the photo where you want the drone to move. So you can say, I want you to look a little bit over here and the drone will just pivot, right? You're not like confusing the controls. You're just tapping. Super easy, super intuitive. Scan is mostly for 3D models. So you circle the area that you want to scan. The drone's kind of over there where the little green dot is. You get a live view. This is more interesting for you. Um, you set the minimum safe distance that you want it to scan. So you might have it start at 10 meters and go to 100 meters, depending on what kind of you know, site you're looking at. The drone then will start at the top and scan down. 
um, and you just slide to take off and it goes around and it'll tell you how many rings it's done around the and it's triggering the camera so um, it's taking pictures as it scans in um, and so that the gimbal will tilt and then when it gets to the top it'll do a cross hatch so you can get those um, the nadir imaging um, and then survey survey is probably the most useful tool for you so you just pull up your tablet you have a map of your site cached in there from Google Maps or whatever. If it's an LTE uh, site, it'll load automatically. If you're uh, going out in the field, you might want to cache the maps, which you can totally do. You take your finger and you circle the area um, that you want to survey. It looks kind of like that. Um, and then the drone automatically calculates what distance it needs to fly um, in order to get that survey. And you can set the res resolution. So you can do high resolution, which is like one to five centimeters, medium, which is about 10 centimeters per pixel, um, or low, which is, I think, 30, 30 centimeters per pixel. That sets what height the drone is going to fly at. So it'll fly at 100 feet, 200 feet, or 400 feet, and how slow it needs to go in order to get enough overlap in those pictures to stitch together late, at a later date. Super easy, super intuitive. You can learn to do this in like about, 30 minutes or so, you're probably up and running. Um, it'll give you a safety alert to tell you, like, watch out for trees because it's about to fly over to this green point. Is there a big tree in the way? It'll probably run into it because it's not smart enough yet. And you just slide, and it takes off, and it goes. Um, and it gives you a lot of information along the way of like how much it's done. From there, you're going to just take out the card, uh, the SD card from the camera, and hit geotag. You'll put that in your tablet, and it'll upload all the GPS information to uh, the card and all the photos that are in there. So you have the photo and the GPS information and what height that, that information was taken at. From there, the software will just line up the photos based on the GPS information, and the algorithms will turn the photos and overlap them and stitch them all together into a high-resolution map. That's just done kind of autonomously. Taking the card out is kind of a pain in the ass, um, but it's GoPro, we, we are limited on uploading information to their photos. That's a GoPro problem. That will be fixed with our new mapping Sony camera that's coming out in a couple of months. And that's a 12 megapixel, no fisheye, super high resolution, really crisp uh, camera. Less so GoPro. You can see all your jobs, kind of where the jobs are at. And then all the images are then uploaded to the Autodesk Cloud. Um, and they're stitched together. Autodesk products, mostly for EDU, are free. And so this app, I think, is for It's like. $4.99 a month for commercial, and I think I've gotten it to like $300 for the year for EDU, but it's taken me some serious battles with our finance office. I wanted to make it free. Apparently, we need to pay our software engineers. Um, so I've tried to make it like one-time fee for EDU, 90% off. I'm trying. I'm trying here to help you out. Uh, all, here's all your jobs, how many times it's flown, et cetera. A lot of this is just for workflow management, like within your lab, to know where your job sites are, how many times you've flown, et cetera, what jobs are ready and already stitched within Autodesk. Um, and so you can do, you know, get your high resolution geo tips, your ortho mosaics all stitched together. This is some pond we flew up in, um, up in Washington. You can get your digital elevation models kind of already spit out for you. You can get 3D uh, models. This is um, the Oakland, um, the observatory in Oakland. Shabob. Yeah, Shabob. So it took me all of like two minutes to fly this. This is just 40 GoPro photos. And I had my 16 month old daughter with me in a stroller. And so I just like put the drone down. We, had, we were flying there for, for our sci fi video already. Um, Loaded up, I just circled the area on the map, flew the mission. It took like one of those Trader Joe's like applesauce pouches for this mission. So it's just 40 photos. It's not even all that great. Um, and then I just upload it. This is Pix4D. This is probably the premier mapping software out there. Drone to Map is actually the back end. It's just Pix4D, uh, which is a Swiss-based company. 40 photos stitched together into, uh, it doesn't usually ripple like that. But you can see like the lines aren't great. But like you could po totally put this in a CAD model and like, Put this in whatever product you want. We could print this off. I mean, it's not a great model, but if I would have taken 200 photos and flown at a lower rate, it would be a perfect ideal model that you could take quantitative measurements on. So photogrammetry today is fairly amazing compared, like you don't need LIDAR. Unless you're like engineering um, and need it down to millimeter level, like l photogrammetry is fine. Just fly so slower, lower with better cameras. And you can spin it and do these cool videos for talks, which is like, Super easy to do, but people are really impressed. 
It's just like spin it and you just hit the video button and then export the, imp imp uh, the MP4. Is the ripple I don't know what that is. It might be just slow in my computer. Yeah. yeah, is it? So Pix4D. Pix4D is expensive. Um, it's $2,000 for the EDU license or $6,700 for 25 computers for their teaching license. But one license for the commercial, uh, or commercial uh, license is like $6,500. So like, it, all I would say is like, don't mess around with Autodesk and our products. Like, go for Pix4D and like, get the, the teaching license and you can have the most cutting edge, full license, ready to go to teach on 25 computers and you're done with it. And $6,500 sounds like a lot, but not for 25 computers with a full license for the most cutting edge stitching software. From this, you can push whatever file type you want into ArcGIS, et cetera. Um, and it's super easy. You just upload your photos. It generates a cloud point. You tell it what kind of, if you want an orthomosaic, digital elevation model, or 3D model. Um, you hit stitch. Uh, you just click the little tabs. It stitches it all together for you into you know, 3 million points. Um, and from there, you can push it into wherever you want. And this is, this is um, an example of that. It, you don't have to just use a drone data. This is Pix4D. This is, they were mapping this castle. Most of the drone mapping software packages out there, even the monthly ones, et cetera, that are coming out, most of it's Pix4D engine running in the background. They just won't tell you that. So here they're using a lot of different drone types. That's a Phantom from DJI. The other was an EB. These things are like 400 bucks now. They're pretty good. GoPro photos, still photos on foot. So they also had ground control points so you can lay out targets, right, for after the fact from lining them up with the algorithms. So they took like, I don't know, 6,000 photos or something here. It's all super easy. And then you get this beautiful model. This is like, probably took them weeks to stitch, 95 million points. Yeah, it's, I mean, this was a serious effort on their part, but you can get both inside and outside um, three d dimensional models at five millimeters like that's that 's lidar quality right there, and it looks pretty amazing so we don 't even sell pix forty and I feel like I am an advocate because I think like you don 't have a lot of money to like be buying fifty million different products. you can go for some of the cheaper products. But I wouldn't. I would just pick the top high-end stitching um, platform and just, you know, and just go from there. Um, this was another platform I was just going to show you. Let's see if I, I don't have it. Uh, I don't have the data up here. This is just a panoramic, so the drone can take off and do a panoramic. And what's really cool about it is um, it's like Google Street View, where you can pan around and look at it. So you can go up and just do a pano, so the drone will just take pictures, and then the gimbal will tilt and take some more pictures, and then it'll tilt. Um, let's see if I can get on. Yeah, it's okay. We're running out of time. But um, then what's really cool also is, so a lot of the drone industry is going towards virtual reality. So taking 360 degree images. So we, this is Kodak's 360 camera. We put two of them on so that you get 360 degree view. Um, here it is smushed down. And it's not going to look as cool. But what this allows you to do, this is flattened out, is that you can do a survey and a transect in 360 degrees, and then you can use your phone and look around in 360 degrees, or you can use virtual reality goggles, right? You can use Google uh, Cardboard or some other goggle. And that way you're thinking in space and in time, but in virtual reality, you don't have to go out and measure everything, you know, if you're counting penguins or whatever as a biologist. I can just fly a transect, and then after the fact, I can put virtual reality goggles on and just look around and count the things that 
I need to count or do the surveys that I need to count. So it's a way to think about augmenting our reality um, in space and time in ways that we're not thinking about today. We're really thinking about maps and three-dimensional maps, but we should be thinking about 360 degrees as well. Uh, maybe even just for teaching, right? So if we can go in and we can map this castle, but then I can give you 360 degree video, drone video of that, like it's ir experiential in a way that's like totally mind blowing. Um, that's just thinking about ag. Um, so let me just summarize. So here's what you can do today. You can do virtual transects. You can do inspections. You can do perfect circles around your site. You can have, this is streams I was just, doing a fisheries talk. Um, you can have the drone follow you. It can look at you or it can look at something else. You can map in 2 and 3D. You can do digital elevation models. You can do hemispheric panoramics. You can do 360 degree data. You can do repeated measures because you can save those flight paths and just fly them over and over and over again. You can develop your own apps. So there could be an archaeological drone app that's developed for specifically the way that you sample your sites in space and time. You can add your own sensors so that you're flying in you know, high resolution color, thermal, multispectral, LiDAR. You can send these products to ArcGIS or Autodesk in your standard kind of you know, data overlays. Um, I don't know what else you want, but that's where the industry is today. Um, and so the hardware is going to get cheaper and better and easier to use. Um, the regulations, sof software will overtake hardware. So hardware, like at some point, a drone is a drone is a drone. And then it's really about the software applications. Um, I was, again, talking to ecologists, but archaeologists should be thinking about, like, what are your data needs? And how do you, you know, spend time developing applica software applications that will then, you know, rapidly advance the field um, in a way that you haven't really thought of? And that's not going to come from the industry because archaeology is pretty narrow. Ecology is pretty narrow compared to oil and gas or, or infrastructure inspection. Um, but you know, with a, tens of thousands of dollars and a couple of software engineers, like you're talking about you know, transforming the field in a way that you know, is, is, is super important for moving um, the theory forward. Uh, virtual reality, I think, is really cool. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I think in terms of surveys and also teaching, it's going to be awesome. Uh, and then the rules and regulations, they're going to get a lot easier here in the coming months. We're pushing really hard. In fact, there was some rule that was introduced in the Senate yesterday by some senators about uh, pivoting the drone regulations for EDU and making them more like hobby grade regulations. So just following some basic rules, because right now we're crippled in, in education today because you need to have a pilot's license and a 333 or a COA. Uh, the UC system just passed a blanket COA, um, but you still need either a 333 pilot um, uh, for uh, teaching, um, or you can just use flight netting. So if you just net a space, like a big batting cage, then you're exempt from FAA rules because it's considered indoor use, but you can still get G GPS connect connectivity for the drones, so they're still really sta stable. That's not good for the field work, but for teaching, you can just have a big batting cage, which Kansas State just built a 200 by 300 by 50 foot tall netted space. It's like the world's largest batting cage for some utility poles and a, tens of thousands of dollars in netting. But they're teaching every single day and want their program to grow you know, and be on the cutting edge. So netting is kind of the, the way to go until the rules lighten up. I'm talking to the UC reserve system. Um, so like Blue Oak Ranch is close by. You can get a 333 pilot. We can train you in mapping um, just for a day's worth of time of a pilot. You can learn in a day basically everything that you would need to know to use in the field somewhere, somewhere abroad. Or you can buy today as a hobbyist yourself you know, for 1500 bucks or whatever um, and go out and start practicing today. Um, you can come down. We do public fly days down at Cesar Chavez. You can come down and fly. We're happy to teach you how to fly. Uh, in the park for free, like we don't charge or anything like that. Um, and so you're really in like a good position here at Cal um, and in the Bay Area in particular to be on the cutting edge. Um, but it is moving incredibly quickly and most academics are way behind. Um, and they want to sit around and like talk about it instead of being like, no, we gotta, you got to move fast and you need to buy something new every six months and you need to pivot. And how are we going to publish these data? And what data are going to be required when we do publish them? Like journals and editors, they're not set up for, for thinking about how quickly this needs to move. I'm trying to publish this paper right now on just like advice for scientists in the field. And it's like, I can't wait six weeks to 
three months for the public for the peer review process. Like I would rather put it up on the blog and have it available today than to wait for three months when it's going to be outdated. Like my, I'm just going to have to change the paper. And they don't understand that. They're like, well, you work for a private company. And, um, here's, oh, that's Kansas State's. You can email Abby at US Netting in Erie, Pennsylvania. She'll get you a deal on netting. Uh, lots and lots of needs within the field in terms of like, Basically, this is again towards our ecologists, but like, how good is our drone compared to some other drones? How repeatable are the data? What about GPS noise, et cetera? All of these are questions that the industry is not going to answer that you um, are going to have to answer for your specific field. You know, how good are these different cameras and different autopilots and different stitching engines? You know, all put together, like those are all areas for mistakes and noise to occur. How do you make that transparent in the publication process? I don't know. I don't know. But I don't have to figure it out because I'm no longer in academia. But it's something to think about. You should be thinking critically about drones too. Like just because they're a cool novel toy doesn't mean the data are as good as they need to be today. Um, so that needs to be tested. Um, Prepare to move quickly. Like this is an exponentially growing industry. Like if the U.S., I don't think drones. I think the ship is going to sail and not sink. Um, I think we're too far along, and there's too much money, and there's too uh, big of a lobbying space within uh, D.C. to shut down the industry, even if someone did something incredibly stupid. Um, and if not, it would just move abroad. We go to Australia or France or Switzerland or somewhere else. Um, and, and just move the company. But prepare for this exponential increase, which means don't spend too much money. You know, think in the two to five to $10,000 range. Don't go for these commercial grade vehicles that are $50,000, $100,000. Because are they any better than like, I can sell you this drone for like, the drone is like $699, but like the GoPro is like more, almost more expensive than the drone itself. Um, so think about two to, $5,000 with the software, or if you want other different imagery, you know, the cameras are going to be more expensive than the drone. A thermal camera is $25 to $7,000. Um, and then just talk to us. Like, I'm happy to, like, we're down on Fourth Avenue. Like, there's a great coffee shops down there all the time. Um, we're happy to work with you to set up your platform. I give academic pricing on everything. Like, I try and get it almost at cost. Um, to EDU. In particular, we like Cal. Most of our faculty or most of our staff come from, well, there's a couple Stanford people, but uh, we like Cal. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we only have a few minutes and I threw a lot at you, but uh, thanks for having me up. It's fun to come up. checks and balances do you have upon your marketing? Yeah, so we do a couple of things. So it turns out that like people, most people are good, and some people are stupid, and then some people want to do bad things, right? And so for the people that are good and are not educated, we built into our app. Um, we work with a, a, another app company called AirMap, and so when you pull up our app, um, you can see, it gives you a little, uh, subset of the map, and it gives you either a red or yellow um, or green light system in terms of are you flying too close to an airport, etc. We build that right into the app. Um, and so when I was in DC a couple of weeks ago meeting on, with the science committee for science and policy and whatever, it turns out like you shouldn't try and bring a drone into the White House. It's like not a good idea. Even though it's completely illegal, but like this drone has been in the break room of the Secret Service office. That's where I thought it was going to stay forever, but I got it back. Um, so we try and build into the, the uh, safety measures, like in terms of like educating the public on where they can fly, already built into the app, you know, automatically. So if you're too close to Oakland Airport, or if there happens to be an air show or some or a wildfire, it'll show yellow, you know, a temporary flight restriction. Uh, out of the box, we're we're capped um, at 400 feet, which is the FAA rules. 400 feet above takeoff, so you could be at 8,000 feet, but you're only going to go up 400 feet. Uh, as well as you can geofence, etc., into it. Uh, 
we're capped at 50 miles an hour or so. Like, um, but we sell to, you can buy us at a Best Buy or overnight to Amazon, etc. Like, we sell to, you don't have to have a background check for drones. You have to register with them with the FAA. It costs $5 and it takes about three minutes. And so you're supposed to put all your information on there uh, in terms of where you live and like the serial number of your drone. Bad people probably aren't going to do that. Well, um, what, I, what I was involved in was a, a huge purchase of, of computer, US manufactured computers that actually were uh, how the KGB was running its operation in the 1970s. Yeah, we that don't was, sell to the KGB. It was, it was an international <laughs> question. We, so we don't sell to the military for military purposes because we'll get ITAR restrictions uh, on our drones. Some of the thermal cameras we can't export, but we're in 22 countries around the world and expanding, um, as well as uh, we don't sell to like Iran and Syria and a couple of different countries. But otherwise, like, we're democratizing drones. It's, it's totally a scary thing. Is it a good idea? A lot of people seem to think so. Are bad things it's gonna happen? Probably, just like with cars and guns and everything else. So that's kind of what we're on the hills trying to figure out. Like, what are logical restrictions? Uh, you know, how do we maximize the safety benefit? NASA's working on how do we manage the low elevation airspace? How do we get drones to talk to manned aircraft, talk to each other, and talk to the ground? We've already had more drones registered in the U.S. in two months with the new FAA rules than any manned aircraft out there. So there are more drones than manned aircraft now, and that will only, you know, multiply. So it's a brave new world. Like, is it good? I don't know, but it's different. <laughs> These are related questions in that, um, from my use of your photogrammetry, you got to be kind of close in to these sites that. You know, that you need, if I'm doing something about volumetrics uh, in a plaza or in some place mm -hmm. that might be agricultural space or irrigation canals, that I need to get kind of close in. So we've been using, you know, kites and poles to pull our cameras up to take our shots before you sort of scan or something, right? But in a place like the forest near Mono Lake, you know, I'm doing stupid stuff like shooting arrows over trees and running you know, right. cable cam. I was like, oh, I don't have to launch arrows over trees anymore. But the trees are too close together for me to be comfortable flying an RPG I found into the yeah. into the forest, right? And in places that um, you know, I could launch the thing higher than the tree, but then I wouldn't get the resolution I need to get, you know, the the photogrammetry to give me accurate volumetrics, yeah, right? Totally. And I can see this happening in say like Yosemite, you know, like I can see the trees being a big deal. Yeah. And yet, the drone allowing us to do things that without me you know, stringing trees with parachute cord could be really useful. So, what would be, is there any way to bring these two things yeah, together? Yeah, I mean, drones, so like the whole, I mean, so at some point, like a drone is like you can't fly through trees no matter what, you know. But it can fly in GPS environments and in the understory, like they'll get better obstacle avoidance, but like, like the new Phantom 4, you know, it's supposed yeah. to have, like, it's supposed to avoid obstacles with the new front-facing cameras, but that's only facing forward. And I'm like, what kind of obstacles? Like, power lines are really hard to avoid if you're a computer. Like, you just can't see them. So maybe tiny little twigs. Uh, you know, you're just at some point like you're going to have to complement the drone data with on the ground data. And so hopefully, what a drone does is give you that, you know, give you the quick and easy data and save you a lot of time for that. You know, not shooting arrows over the trees to get. They just can't be surveys, but you know, complementing it with on the ground other photogrammetry measurements like we did in that video. Mm -hmm. So drones aren't going to solve everything, but hopefully they'll speed up a lot of the process that can be automated and save you time so that you can you know do the things that are tedious and require a measuring tape that you stretch out and quadra. Yeah. How much does the uh, software package that does the survey and scanning cost? So our scan, that app, I think it's going to be thirty dollars a month or three sixty for the year. I'm trying to get the package to be I'm still in negotiation with our finance office. Um, I think it's going to be twenty five hundred bucks for the drone, four batteries, a backpack, the GoPro, a Sony Xperia tablet, and the app. Does that be EDU discount? That's EDU. It'd be like ten thousand dollars. That's like, it's like, 
our nickel and dime percentages here and how much we can still have. On Sunday, I'll just get fired. We're going to make a lot of money now. So, so the Sony camera, is it a rolling shutter or is it a GoPro or is it a uh, big Max 7 with a big uh, detector? It is, I don't know much about it. It's, the QX1 is like a development camera from Sony, so it's not actually a point and shoot camera. It's just like, it looks like a lens with the software built in. Uh, and you can get a zoom on it, so you can pop off the lenses if you want. I think there's a QX1 and a QX30. I'm not, I'm not a camera team. I haven't been looking at it since we don't have it. Quite out yet, but it, the maps are phenomenal. It's 20 megapixel, you know, nice Sony sensor. What would that add to that twenty six hundred bucks? I'm not sure how much the Sony camera is going to be. And you know, and whether it's us or whether it's a different, you know, like company out there, like I'm a really poor salesperson because I'm an academic. But I feel like in general, like drones are getting really cheap. Like if you look at like the Inspire with that high resolution camera on it, like I, their mapping platform is not very good at the moment. But DJI is out to, to conquer the world, and so like if you don't mind flying with a Chinese vehicle and like that your flight data is going to go to Shenzhen and your imagery, which you probably don't care, but like some like US government, like the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, you didn't mention fixed wings. Do you guys have some fixed wings? We had one. So fixed wings are actually like if you look at the marketplace, like maybe ten percent of the market needs a fixed wing for larger spatial scales. And at some point, it's better just to hire a Cessna and like fly a giant sensor array with like every sensor you would want over a huge area. At the moment, like it's just not as cost effective. We're getting it out of the fixed wing market. You can still take Pixhawk and put it on. We have an Aero M, which is our um, but I think the best uh, fixed wing on the market right now is the EV. Like you shake it three times and throw it up in the air, and it's totally integrated with Pix4D because it's a Parrot company, since it flies a Parrot company. I think you're going to see a lot cheaper uh, fixed wings in that more three to five thousand dollar range. Like EV is still like twenty thousand dollars, and then you have the toys, which are like a thousand dollars. I think you're going to see a gap where you're going to really need some nice mapping fixed wings out there with different cameras that you can put on mm -hmm. in the next. So in easy ones that you can still shake and throw up in the air or just draw a map and throw it up in the air and in a, in a map, but we're not going to do that. The battery life would be much better. Yeah, you can get two hours. You can map a thousand acres or two thousand acres mm -hmm. in some of these big swings. But launching them and landing them is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. you're, you're likely to, most of them have to be bone fully, so mm -hmm. you're going to damage things. Anyway, we're around. Like, I'm happy to talk to you. It's nice to come to campus. I'm going to go walk down and talk to the guys. Some really good people after this. Todd Dawson. Todd Dawson. Well, because this camera, so like, this camera is the, called the Parrot Sequoia. And if we can use it to map the sequoias, like the marketing potential there. <laughs> and then we can do it. In, so, National Park's pretty hard to fly at the moment. We're working on that. Um, uh, and really just advocating. So like, I know that there's the Association for American Archaeology, right? there's other associations out there. Getting them on board to write letters for drone rules actually is a, is a good idea. So coming out as an association, an academic association, um, your voice is totally lost between the hobbyist space, which is like, you know, cheap consumer electronic product products, and the commercial space. At EDU, like, is it, the voice is not speaking very loud in terms of on the capital or within the state of California. Right. So, Speak up, write a letter as part of the association. 